Hello, comrades. Once again, it is your host, Mitchell K. Jones, uh, songwriter, musician, uh, which is a very important aspect of this show. Very, very important. Um, so we would never want to neglect that aspect of the show because socialist art is important and every revolution has been driven by songs, marching songs, folk songs, folk music, the, uh, the popular uh, era of the Communist Party of the USA in the 1930s was very much driven by folk music, Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger. The abolitionist movement was driven by Uncle Tom's Cabin, by uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, very successful novel that portrayed the horrors of slavery. The person we're talking about today was a fiction writer and actually his fictional utopian novel inspired a movement across the United States, a utopia, a, a movement that, that tried to blend utopianism and the new revolutionary methods of the Marxists, which we talked about uh, in the episode about the 48ers. So today we are talking about the movements inspired by Edward Bellamy the nationalist clubs, which sprung up uh, as a result of Bellamy's writings. And as a, a precursor to our discussion of Bellamy, we're going to discuss Henry George, his book, Progress and Poverty, published in 1879, which influenced Bellamy's writing. But we can't forget also that Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto, as well as Lawrence Gronlund's The Cooperative Commonwealth, an exposition of modern socialism, uh, published in 1884. Uh, these were all influences on Bellamy's uh, publication of the book Looking Backward, uh, which he published in 1887. Looking Backward caused a sensation and uh, Bellamy clubs were founded throughout the United States and they wanted to advance a form of government that Bellamy called nationalism, whereby industries would be nationalized right so the idea is nationalization that's that's where nationalism comes from it's not the sense that we might know it as an emphasis on the nation but uh, actually nationalism in this sense nationalizing industries he died in 1897 uh, after promoting his ideas he wrote a sequel equality and um, spent spent 10 years promoting his ideas until he died in 1897. And some of the some of the Bellamy clubs and the uh, the nationalist movements uh, actually tried to synthesize Marxism and Bellamyism. It's said that Bellamy's socialist world that he envisions in the novel Looking Backwards enacts Marx's famous saying from each according to ability to each according to needs from the critique of the Gotha program. So Bellamy is very much considered an American in the Marxist tradition, but he Americanized Marxism. So that's what we're going to, to look into in a little bit. And we're, we'll also see how uh, groups like the Kawe Colony in California combined Marxism and Bellamyism. But first we'll examine Henry George a little bit because Henry George's book, Progress and Poverty, was published you know, almost a decade before looking backwards. So we'll talk about him and his idea of a single tax on land. So uh, we'll get into Henry George a little bit and then we'll return to Bellamy. Mm -hmm. 
Living as we do in the closing year of the 20th century, enjoying the blessings of a social order at once so simple and logical that it seems but the triumph of common sense, it is no doubt difficult for those whose studies have not been largely historical to realize that the present organization of society is, in its completeness, less than a century old. No historical fact is, however, better established than that till nearly the end of the 19th century it was the general belief that the ancient industrial system with all its shocking social consequences, was destined to last, with possibly a little patching, to the end of time. How strange and well-nigh incredible does it seem that so prodigious a moral and material transformation as has taken place since then could have been accomplished in so brief an interval. The readiness with which men accustom themselves as matters of course to improvements in their condition, which, when anticipated, seemed to leave nothing more to be desired, could not be more strikingly illustrated. What reflection could be better calculated to moderate the enthusiasm of reformers who count for their reward on the lively gratitude of future ages? The object of this volume is to assist persons who, while desiring to gain a more definite idea of the social contrasts between the 19th and 20th centuries, are daunted by the formal aspect of the histories which treat the subject. Warned by a teacher's experience that learning is accounted a weariness to the flesh, the author has sought to alleviate the instructive quality of the book by casting it in the form of a romantic narrative, which would be glad to fancy not wholly devoid of interest on its own account. socialism. Georgism, also known as the single tax movement, uh, is based on the teachings of Henry George, 
an economist, American economist, and uh, it deals deals with the idea of economic rent caused by land ownership. Um, George believes that there should be total uh, free market. However, he believes that nobody puts labor into land and landlords only make money by actually withholding access to land. And so George's idea is that land was the common property of all. And so that so all tax systems should actually be replaced with a single tax on land. The George's uh, the George's campaign slogan was free trade, free land, free men, uh, similar to the free soilers uh prior to the civil war who i mentioned um, marx expressed support for probably the most well-known contribution of henry george thought to american culture uh was not his seminal book poverty and progress although uh progress and poverty although uh it was inspired by that seminal book um i'm going to read here now Uh, from the Henry George website, how Henry George's principles were corrupted into the game called Monopoly by Edward J. Dodson from December 2011. History is filled with surprising stories of how people and ideas are connected. One such story is that of the origins of the most popular board game in modern history. It's an American classic. Each new generation of Monopoly players learns to love, harmlessly, indulging in cutthroat, ruthless, greedy impulses. Players begin the game as equals. Luck and a bit of strategy eventually enables one player to dominate all others. That player ends up amassing a huge fortune in cash and real estate. Most Monopoly players don't know or or care that this game was originally the product of a passion for social and economic justice. In the late 1800s, a young woman named Elizabeth Mage was introduced to the writings of Henry George by her father. She eventually became one of many people who took on the task of trying to teach others what she learned from studying progress and poverty and George's other works. Collaborating with her friends in Brentwood, Maryland community, in her Brentwood, Maryland community, Elizabeth Magee created the Landlord's Game. She applied for a patent, which was granted on January 5th, 1904. She explained that the game was to be a practical demonstration of the present system of land grabbing with all its usual outcomes and consequences. While still a young single woman, Elizabeth, or Lizzie as she came to be called, became a regular visitor to the single tax enclave of Arden, Delaware. This was around 1903. Whether on her own or in conjunction with other single taxers in Arden, Lizzie continued to work on the design of the landlord's game as a way to explain how Henry George's system of political economy would work in real life. In 1906, Elizabeth moved to Chicago, Illinois, where she met and in 1910 married Albert Phillips. At some point in 1906, Elizabeth and a number of other followers of Henry George established the Economic Game Company of New York, which published the Landlord's Game. Soon thereafter, Elizabeth and Albert moved to Clarendon, Virginia, in the Washington, D.C. area, and eventually patented a new edition of the Landlord's Game in 1924 under her married name, Elizabeth Magee Phillips. This new edition, published by the Washington, D.C. firm Ad Game Company, appeared in 1932 and included name streets and other changes in the appearance of the board. More importantly, the new edition included a second alternative set of rules and a second name for the game, Prosperity. Around 1900, Scott Nearing was introduced to the Landlord's Game by either Lizzie Magee or other residents of Arden. He was at the time a full-time resident of Arden. Nearing went on to become a member of the Economics Department at the University of Pennsylvania in 1906, where he used the Landlord's Game in his teaching. His support of Henry George's proposals to raise public revenue exclusively from those who own land, and his opposition to child labor caused him to be dismissed from the university in 1915. Burton H. Wolf in The Monopolization of Monopoly says that Nearing played the landlord's game with his brother Guy Nearing, who lived at the Henry George single tax community of Arden, Delaware. Then, as the students and single taxers played the game, they began a process of alerting the rules. The main change was that instead of merely paying rent when landing on a property block, the players could hold an auction to buy it. They also made their own game boards so that they could replace the properties designated by Lizzie Meiji with properties in their own cities and state. This made playing more realistic. As they drew or painted their own boards, usually on linen or oilcloth, they changed the title Landlord's Game to Auction Monopoly and then just Monopoly 
Burton Wolf also tells us that a young Rexford E. Tugwell was one of the players. One of Tugwell's own students, Priscilla Robertson, longtime editor of The Humanist, provided the following details on the early history of the game. In those days, those who wanted copies of the board for Monopoly took a piece of linen cloth and copied it in crayon. It was considered a point of honor not to sell it to a commercial manufacturer, since it had been worked out by a group of single taxers who were anxious to defeat the capitalist system. Other writers note the game was played by students at Princeton University and Haverford College. Changes were made to the board design, gathering the properties into groups, allowing buildings to be added to the locations, and increasing the amount of rent based on the number of properties owned. Other writers note the game was played by students at Princeton University and Haverford College. Changes were made to the board design, gathering the properties into groups, allowing buildings to be added to the locations, and increasing the amount of rent charged based on the number of like properties owned. By the late 1920s, the version of the game being played by college students and others had evolved quite a bit from Elizabeth's design. The game was now generally referred to as Monopoly. A young student at Williams College produced a commercial version under the name Finance, but the game was, event was essentially Monopoly. Then a woman named Ruth Hoskins, who learned the game in Indianapolis, moved to Atlantic City, New Jersey, and supposedly created the version that included the Atlantic City street names. Then the plot thickens. The game was introduced by Eugene, Colonel, and Ruth Rayford, friends of Ruth Hopkins, to Charles Todd, who had lived in Germantown, Pennsylvania, and Charles Todd then introduced the game to Charles and Esther Darrow. Eugene Rayford, Charles Todd, and Esther Jones Darrow all attended the Quaker Westtown School from 1911 to 1914 or 15. The subsequent connection with Atlantic City occurred because the close association of the West Town School and the Atlantic City's Friends School. As Todd later recalled, the first people we taught it to after learning it was Darrow and his wife Esther. It was entirely new to them. Darrow asked me if I would write up the rules and regulations and I wrote them up and gave them to Darrow. During the last few decades, details of how the game Monopoly came to be owned and the profits from sales monopolized have come to light because of the circumstances that could not be controlled by Parker Brothers. Charles Darrow was the first to capitalize on the evolution and popularity of the game. He secured a copyright for his enhanced version of the game in 1933. The familiar cardboard board, packaged in a white box, was produced and sold locally in Philadelphia. In 1935, Darrow submitted the game to the U.S. Patent Office and was granted a patent. The game's origins apparently were not appreciated by the patent office clerks. Sales of the game mushroomed and Charles Darrow became wealthy. Parker Brothers became a major company on the profits of Monopoly. Much to the credit for the recent interest in the Landlord's Game, Elizabeth Magee Phillips and the connection to Henry George's social and economic philosophy belongs to Ralph Anspach. In 1973, while on the economics faculty of San Francisco State University, Professor Anspach designed a new game, which he called Anti-Monopoly. When Anspach's game began to compete with Monopoly on store shelves, General Mills, successor to Parker Brothers, filed a lawsuit against Professor Anspach for patent infringement. A decade-long legal battle ensued during which the lower court actually ordered thousands of copies of Anti-Monopoly destroyed. Professor Anspach presented the historical evidence revealing that Charles D Darrow essentially had essentially taken the game virtually without change in the design of rules from the version produced by Charles Todd. References to Elizabeth's endeavors appear in George's periodicals. In a 1926 issue of Land and Freedom, it was announced that a group of single taxers contemplates a new and improved edition of the Landlord's Game. Elizabeth also remained an active single taxer, and in 1931 was a delegate to the Henry George Congress held in Baltimore, Maryland during October. Parker Brothers purchased Elizabeth's patent in 1932 for $500 un under condition that Parker Brothers would continue to publish the Landlord's Game as well as Monopoly. Burton Wolf describes a meeting, the, a meeting the Parker Brothers president, Robert Barron, and Elizabeth. So Barron wet, met with Lizzie Magee. He testified and after and asked her if she would accept changes in her game. According to Barron's recollection, she replied like this. No, this is to teach the Henry George theory of single taxation, and I will not have my game changed in any way whatsoever. For John Droger of San Francisco, the lawyer taking his deposition, Barton explained why, in his opinion, Lizzie Magee answered that way. She was a rabid Henry George single tax advocate, a real evangelist, and these people never change. In a January 1936 interview in the Washington Star, Elizabeth was asked how she felt about getting only $500 for her patent and no royalties ever. She replied that it was all right with her if she never made a dime so long as Henry George's single tax idea was spread to the people of the country.
A third edition of the Landlord's Game was published by Parker Brothers in 1939, but the company did nothing to promote it. In fact, the game was almost immediately recalled from stores and almost every unsold copy destroyed. Today, very few copies survive. Consistent with the agreement with Elizabeth, the game came with two sets of rules. However, only the rules copyrighted by Parker Brothers were actually sold with the game. Purchases were required to contact Elizabeth Meiji Phillips to obtain the alternative rules. Remarkably, Elizabeth's rules were made available by Hasbro on the company's website. In an essay written by Elizabeth, appeared in the September-October 1940 issue of Land and Freedom, under the title, A Word to the Wise. Even in her declining years, she was urging surviving single taxers to action. What is the value of our philosophy if we do not do our utmost to apply it? To simply know a thing is not enough. To merely speak of or write of it occasionally among ourselves is not enough. We must do something about it on a large scale if we are to make headway. These are critical times and drastic action is needed. To make any worthwhile impression on the multitude, we must go in droves into the sacred precincts of the men we are after. We must not only tell them, but show them just how and why and where our claims can be proven in some actual situation. Elizabeth Meiji Phillips died in 1948 in Arlington, Virginia. like Arden get its start. People can get together and plan a village on their own, or they can be part of a philosophical movement. The people who founded Arden were dedicated to an economic philosophy called the single tax. Arden has its origins in the late 1800s when a newspaper man named Henry George tried to understand why there was such desperate poverty in the midst of great and prosperous cities. He came to think that poverty results from the unfair use of the land and unreasonable taxes. Now, if you tax the fruit of a man's labor, he won't work as hard and he'll produce less. But if you tax the land, there won't be less land. He developed a theory in which a single tax on the value of the land would replace all other taxes. The single tax theory became so popular that the single taxes decided they had to have a place to try out their experiment and theory. And it had to be between near New York or somewhere near Philadelphia because that's where most of the leading single taxes lived. So they looked around and they selected the little state of Delaware with its three counties and a population of about 125,000. In the Delaware elections of 1896, a band of single taxers campaigned up and down the state. They brought their knapsacks and leaflets and lectured to any audience they could find and were finally arrested in Dover. Depraved and irresponsible vagabonds, they were called. Pests of society. For single taxers, the elections were a disaster. They got less than 3% of the vote. Now, one of the single taxers was Will Price, an architect. Another was a sculptor named Frank Stevens. They decided that if they couldn't get a whole state to go single tax, why, they would start their own single tax village. For $9,000, they bought an old farm six miles north of Wilmington, Delaware. They put up $2,500 of their own money and borrowed the balance from millionaire Joe Fells of Fells Napa Soap. Fells supported single tax projects all over the country. They made Arden a trust with three trustees controlling the land. Anyone who lives in Arden leases his land for 99 years and pays rent to the trustees who use the money to meet expenses. <laughs> 
You're hearing an educational documentary about the single tax community of Arden, Delaware. Remarkably, interestingly enough, uh, the current president, Joe Biden, actually lived uh, in Arden, Delaware for a short time during his childhood. One of the early settlers in Arden was Scott Neary, who was an economic professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Scott and his wife, Helen, now live on a farm in Maine and have worked out their own kind of independent, self-sufficient household economy. Well, I went to Arden in the first instance because a local Arden resident named, resident named Fred Whiteside was uh, <clears throat> renting a piece of land there and he wanted somebody to go with him who could do a little surveying. And uh, I was I could do a little surveying, so I went down with him over the weekend. And uh, I found that there was a nice swimming hole and uh, a nice group of uh, crafty people. I mean, crafts people, and uh, a very nice social atmosphere, and also a very tolerant uh, ideological atmosphere, because at Arden there were socialists and single taxers and anarchists and all kinds of people and. Also, uh, conservatives who had no ideas at all. So, uh, under the circumstances, I found that I could rent a piece of land, half an acre of land, for $13 a year. So I immediately put down $13 and rented a half an acre on the corner of the common. That was my first introduction to Arden, and I stayed there off and on for about 10 years. At that time, most of the people in Arden were what the economists would call lower, lower middle class. They were not well-to-do people, they were not affluent people, they were not poverty stricken, but they were poor enough and uh, craft-minded enough so that they were willing and anxious to build their own houses and make repairs and do a lot of the work around the place themselves. In fact, one of the attractive things about Arden was that you could uh, take care of your own place without losing cash. Now, today, China has... Uh, a land value tax, um, similar to what George proposed, but it's not a single tax. And uh, George's single tax idea um, today puts him somewhat, well, in, in the United States, somewhat in the libertarian uh, category. Now, there are actually um, Georgist parties um, throughout the world. In fact, Rutherford B. Hayes himself had some leanings towards Georgism. Of course, we know uh, Rutherford B. Hayes as the, the president who became president in a, a, the uh, grand bargain with the devil that ended Reconstruction. Um, Milton Friedman, even, the arch-neoliberal, the arch-theorist of neoliberalism, uh, the author of Augusto Pinochet's uh, economic policy in Chile, uh, he even praised George um, saying that the single tax was the least bad tax. Um, ultimately, George's ideas are limited. Um, Karl Marx wrote to his friend Friedrich Adolf Sorge in 1881, June of 1881. So I'll read to you what Marx uh, told his friend Friedrich Adolf Sorge, a German, German uh, communist who emigrated to the United States, he was actually, um, you know, a, a 48er himself. So this is what he, he wrote to Sorge, who was living in Hoboken, New Jersey at the time. Before your copy of Henry George arrived, I had already received two others, one from Swinton and one from Willard Brown. I therefore gave one to Engels and one to Lafargue. Today, I must confine myself to a very brief formulation of my opinion of the book. Theoretically, the man is utterly backward. He understands nothing about the nature of surplus value and so wanders about in speculations which follow the English model, but have now been suspended superseded, even among the English, about the different portions of surplus value to which independent existence is attributed, about the relations of profit, rent, interest, etc. 
His fundamental dogma is that everything would be all right if ground rent were paid to the state. You'll find payment of this kind among the transitional measures, including in the Communist Manifesto, too. Editor's note, and also in China's system today. This idea originally belonged to the bourgeois economists. It was first put forward, apart from a similar demand at the end of the 18th century, by the earliest radical followers of Ricardo soon after his death. I said of it in 1847, in my work against Proudhon, we can understand that economists like Mill, the elder, not his son John Stewart, who also represents this in a somewhat modified form, Cherbuliets, Hilditch, and others demanded that rent should be paid to the state in order that it may serve as a substitute for taxes. This is a frank expression of the hatred with which the industrial capitalist dedicates to the landed proprietor, which seems to him a useless and superfluous element in the general total of bourgeois production. We ourselves, as I have already mentioned, adopted this appropriation of ground rent by the state, among numerous other transitional measures, which, as we also remarked in the manifesto, are and must be contradictory in themselves. But the first person to turn this requirement of the radical Eng English bourgeois economist into a socialist panacea, to declare this procedure to be the solution of the antagonisms involved in the present method of production, was Collins, a former of old hussar officer of Napoleon's, born in Belgium, who in the later days of Guizot and the first Napoleon of the last favored the world from Paris with some fat volumes about this discovery of his. Like another discovery he made, namely, that while there is no God, there is an immortal human soul and that animals have no feelings. For if they had feelings, that is souls, we should be cannibals and a realm of righteousness could never be founded upon this earth. His anti-landlordship theory, together with his theory of the soul, etc., have been preached every month for years in the Parisian philosophy of the future by his few remaining followers, mostly Belgians. They call themselves radical or rational collectivists and have praised Henry George. After them, besides them, and among other people, the Prussian banker and former lottery owner Samton from East Prussia, a shallow brain fellow, has eked out this socialism into a thick volume. All these socialists since Collins have this much in common, that they leave wage labor and therefore capitalist production in existence and try to bamboozle themselves or the world into believing that if ground rent were transformed into a state tax, all the evils of capitalist production would disappear of themselves. The whole thing is therefore simply an attempt decked out with socialism to save capitalist domination and indeed to establish it afresh on an even wider basis than its present one. This cloven hoof, at the same time ass's hoof, is also unmistakably revealed in the declamations of Henry George. And it is the more unpardonable in him because he ought to have put the question to himself in just the opposite way. How did it happen that in the United States, where relatively, that is in comparison with civilized Europe, the land was accessible to the great mass of the people, and to a certain degree, again relatively still is, capitalist economy and the corresponding enslavement of the working class has developed more rapidly and shamelessly than in any other country. On the other hand, George's book, like the sensation it has made with you, is significant because it is a first, if unsuccessful, attempt at emancipation from the orthodox political economy. Henry George does not seem, for the rest, to know anything about the history of the early American anti-renters, who were rather practical men than theoretical. Otherwise, he is a talented writer, with a talent for Yankee advertisement, too, as his article on California and the Atlantic Powers proves, for instance. He also has the repulsive presumption and arrogance which is dis displayed by all panacea mongers, without exception. Well, as I said, George 
fairly influential in American politics in the late 19th century. Uh, Helen Keller, the disability activist, advocate for various socialist causes, union advocate, and actually the the only socialist I can think of that's on U.S. currency. Uh, she's actually on the Alabama State Quarter. Um, she said of Henry George, who reads shall find in Henry George's philosophy a rare beauty and power of inspiration and a splendid faith in the essential nobility of human nature. So like I said, one of the people that read Henry George and was inspired by him also read the Communist Manifesto and some of the other more popular populist socialist things of the day. The uh, Danish-American lawyer, writer, lecturer, and activist Lawrence Gronland, who was a Marxist and wrote The Cooperative Commonwealth, an exposition of modern socialism in 1884. These people influenced, it influenced Edward Bellamy's book, Looking Backward, 2000 to 1887, a science fiction story of Julian West, the main character, a young American, who falls into a deep sleep, like a Rip Van Winkle character induced by hypnosis, and he wakes up a century later in the year 2000. He's in Boston, Massachusetts, and the Boston of the year 2000 is a socialist utopia. In the course of an early morning constitutional, I visited Charleston. Among the changes, too numerous to attempt to indicate, which marked the lapse of a century in that quarter, I particularly noted the total disappearance of the old state prison. That went before my day, but I remember hearing about it, said Dr. Leed, when I alluded to the fact at the breakfast table. We have no jails nowadays. All cases of atavism are treated in the hospitals. Of atavism? I exclaimed, staring. Why, yes, replied Dr. Leed. The idea of dealing punitively with those unfortunates was given up at least fifty years ago, and I think more. I don't quite understand you, I said. Hatavism in my day was a word applied to the cases of persons in whom some trait of a remote ancestor recurred in a noticeable manner. I might understand that crime is nowadays looked upon as the recurrence of an ancestral trait. I beg your pardon, said Dr. Leed, with a smile half humorous, half deprecating. But since you have so explicitly asked the question, I am forced to say that the fact is precisely that. After what I had already learned of the moral contrasts between the 19th and the 20th centuries, it was doubtless absurd in me to begin to develop sensitiveness on the subject, and probably, if Dr. Leed had not spoken with that apologetic air, and Mrs. Leed and Edith shown a corresponding embarrassment, I should not have flushed, as I was conscious I did. I, I was not in much danger of being vain of my generation before, I said, but really, this is your generation, Mr. West, interposed Edith. It is the one in which you are living, you know, and it is only because we are alive now that we call it ours. Thank you. I will try to think of it so, I said, and as my eyes met hers, their expression quite cured my senseless sensitiveness. After all, I said, with a laugh, I was brought up a Calvinist, and ought not to be startled to hear crime spoken of as an ancestral trade. In point of fact, said Dr. Leed, our use of the word is no reflection at all on your generation. If, begging Edith's pardon, we may call it yours, so far as seeming to imply that we think ourselves, apart from our circumstances, better than you were. In your day, fully nineteen twentieth of the crime, using the word broadly to include all sorts of misdemeanors, resulted from the inequality in the possessions of individuals. Want tempted the poor. Lust of greater gains, or the desire to preserve former gains, tempted the well-to-do. Directly or indirectly, the desire for money, which then meant every good thing, was the motive of all this crime, the taproot of a vast poison growth, which the machinery of law, courts, and police could barely prevent from choking your civilization outright, when we made the nation the sole trustee of the wealth of the people, and guaranteed to all abundant maintenance, on the one hand abolishing want, and on the other checking the accumulation of riches, we cut this root, and the poison tree that overshadowed your society with it, like Jonas Gort in a day. As for the comparatively small class of violent crimes against persons, unconnected with any idea of gain, they were almost wholly confined, even in your day, to the ignorant and bestial. And in these days, when education and good manners are not the monopoly of a few, but universal, such atrocities are scarcely ever heard of, 
You now see why the word atavism is used for crime. It is because nearly all forms of crime known to you are motiveless now, and when they appear can only be explained as the outcropping of ancestral traits. You used to call persons who stole, evidently without any rational motive, kleptomaniacs, and when the case was clear, deemed it absurd to punish them as thieves. Your attitude toward the genuine kleptomaniac is precisely ours toward the victim of atavism, an attitude of compassion and firm but gentle restraint. Your courts must have an easy time of it, I observed, with no private property to speak of, no disputes between citizens over business relations, no real estate to divide or debts to collect, there must be absolutely no civil business at all for them, and with no offences against property and mighty few of any sort to provide criminal cases, I should think you might almost do without judges and lawyers altogether. We do without the lawyers, certainly, was Dr. Leeds' reply. It would not seem reasonable to us, in a case where the only interest of the nation is to find out the truth, that persons should take part in the proceedings who had an acknowledged motive to color it. But who defends the accused? If he is a criminal, he needs no defense, for he pleads guilty in most instances, replied Dr. Leed. The plea of the accused is not a mere formality with us as with you. It is usually the end of the case. Y you don't mean that the man who pleads not guilty is thereupon discharged? No, I do not mean that. He is not accused on light grounds, and if he denies his guilt, it must still be tried. But trials are few, for in most cases the guilty man pleads guilty. When he makes a false plea and is clearly proved guilty, his penalty is doubled. Falsehood is, however, so despised among us that few offenders would lie to save themselves. That is the most astounding thing you have yet told me, I exclaimed. If lying has gone out of fashion, this is indeed the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness which the prophet foretold. Such is, in fact, the belief of some persons nowadays, was the doctor's answer. They hold that we have entered upon the millennium, and the theory from their point of view does not lack plausibility. But as to your astonishment at finding that the world has outgrown lying, there is really no ground for it. And there you heard from the audiobook of Looking Backward. Now we'll read a piece entitled Looking Backward, Marxism Americanized by Mara Abrash from the Utopian Studies Journal from 1991. And Abrash begins, A certain 19th century writer, also active in journalism, created an extraordinary utopian vision in which all productive facilities were owned by society. Unlike the great majority of earlier utopian proposals, this one was specifically applicable to full-blown industrial technology and organization, which under centralized rational direction for use rather than profit, was presumed capable of providing all the world's people with the material necessities of a good life. The writer also envisioned an egalitarian incomes policy and the elimination of social classes. His vision spread rapidly and became part of Western civilization's heritage of powerful ideas. The summary thus far fits Edward Bellamy and just as clearly fits Karl Marx. But when we move ahead to the reception of their doctrines, a sharp divergence appears. Marx was fiercely attacked, harried out of country, one country after another, and his name became, among respectable people, a byword for social and economic iniquity. Bellamy, on the other hand, became an honored citizen, and his formula for utopia was accepted even by its opponents as within the bounds of legitimate American political discourse. What accounts for so dramatic a contrast in American reaction to visions sharing similarly radical institutional features? To the individualistic American mind, in fact, Bellamy's regimented industrial army should have seemed more outrageous than the Marxist withering away of the state. But looking backward found advocates in factories, farms, colleges, and New England drawing rooms alike. Why should it have commanded respectful attention from such disparate elements of a citizenry, notably resistant, then is now, to economic or political programs straying very far from the middle of the road? Obviously, Bellamy succeeded in domesticating Marx's ends and means so that they seemed compatible with American ideals and traditions. No mean feat. Even more remarkable is that he apparently accomplished this more or less incidentally. He did not set out to tame Marxist theory as a whole or take the sting out of particular fear-inducing elements for the good reason that he was not a student of Marxism. He had, surprisingly enough, probably not even read Marx at the time he wrote Looking Backward. 
Although there is no sure proof of this proposition, we have Bellamy's own word for it that I have never seen in any sense a student of socialistic literature or have known more of the various socialist schemes than any newspaper reader might. This dic disclaimer receives support, although at a much earlier date, from a line in his review of Nordhoff's The Communistic Societies of the United States. The words socialist and communist fall unpleasantly on American ears, being generally taken as implying atheistic and superstitious beliefs and practices and abnormal sex relations. Nothing in Bellamy's writings, up to looking backward, indicates awareness of the subtlety, scope, and intellectual rigor of Marx's scientific socialism. The long chapter on looking backward in Krishnan Kumar's recent survey of utopias concludes that Bellamy had not studied Marx before writing the work, but did so afterwards. That may be the plausible scenario. It means, however, that Bellamy, through coincidence or in intuition, succeeded in diffusing every incendiary feature and Americanized of Marxism without any clear idea of what Marxism was. If Bellamy had been an expert on Marx and had deliberately set out to restate each threatening element of Marxism in a form acceptable to American sensibilities, there is scarcely anything, as will be explained below, that he would have written differently in looking backward. It should be noted first, however, that deliberation does seem likely an extraordinary care taken not to portray any mass or collective aspects of Boston. 2000. Readers get so absorbed in the utopian substance of what Julian West is told, they fail to notice the direct deception of the society in action is virtually absent. The astonishing fact is that, insofar as looking backward tells a story, there are no people in Boston other than elites. The only exceptions are sales clerks and a waiter, neither of whom had any lines of dialogue or is otherwise individuated. The elites seem to have no relatives and no friends. No one ever visits them, even though they have the hottest attraction in town on their premises. When they walk to the dining house, or when Edith and Julian go to the ward store, they do not run into acquaintances. The entire novel takes place after Julian finds himself in the year 2000 in a city which is, for all novelistic purposes, unpopulated except for the three leads. Bellamy goes to great lengths to maintain this isolation. Julian is taken to a school and a warehouse, but about the former he is cautious. I shall not describe in detail what I saw in the schools that day, and comments only upon physical culture instruction. The visit to the warehouse receives a single paragraph in which Julian provides an analogy in lieu of a description. Typically, the reader gets more information on the subject, not much in any case, from what the leads tell him elsewhere than from what he observes on the spot. Furthermore, the telephone transmission system, of which Bellamy makes so much, has undermined two important 19th century forms of public social interaction. Apparently, no one goes to concerts and few to church. The hugely popular Mr. Barton, be it noted, preaches only by telephone. At home, we have comfort, but the splendor of our life is on its social side, that which we share with our fellows, says Dr. Lee. But nothing in the novel illustrates this. It is in fact the comfort of home which establishes the tone of the new society for Julian. And a thoroughly bourgeois home it is. Father works, mother runs the household with the aid of public facilities and, if necessary, hired help, and daughter shops. Leveling of society, common ownership, dictatorship of the proletariat, free love, few of the proletarian attributes, whether in fact or fancy, of Marx's communism find lodgment in these benign pages. Not only do the working classes not rule in looking backward, but they are shunted even further out of the sight of Bellamy's middle-class reader than their real-life counterparts of 1888. It is significant that the nearest Julian gets to proletarians is at the warehouse, where the work consists of order filling and distribution rather than production. Of labor or laborers in factories, there is not even a pretense of first-hand description anywhere in the book. The only scenes with great numbers of people in the novel, in fact, virtually the only ones, with more than five, are in the Boston of Julian's Nightmare. Here, Bellamy vividly portrays throngs and swarms with an ingenious reversal that it is communism which will obviate mass action and provide the individual with physical and social space needed for good life. This is characteristic of the way in which looking backwards soothes a whole range of fears which assailed most Americans, and to a large extent still do, at the mere mention of Marxism. For example, the fundamental assumption of unresolvable class conflict is sidestepped by the happy assurance that you can make ten times more profit out of your fellow men by uniting them than by contending with them.
This, Dr. Lee explains, failed to be perceived by a 19th century blinkered by individualism. Once the principle of maximum efficiency through cooperation is recognized, desire for gain becomes a reason for consensus, not conflict, and the industrial army's hierarchical organization is deprived of class attributes. The expropriation of capital, which sent chills down the spines of even many Americans who had little to be expropriated, was rendered benign by two facts. The big capitalists, in the form of corporations, voluntarily accepted the new arrangements, and the arrangements themselves could be expressed in a familiar image of corporation and stockholders made reassuringly analogous to nation and citizens. After all, captains of industry and industrial army generals share similar executive characteristics, and it's a fair guess that the latter were initially drawn from the former. The fear of stagnation resulting from the elimination of monetary incentives is combated with a variety of alternative inducements. Public esteem, wider career choice, prestigious awards, and most effective of all, the fact that our women sit aloft as judges of the race and reserve themselves to reward the winners encourage excellence in the industrial army. Actually, in this regard, Bellamy shrewdly appealed to better instincts than Mark, Marx, maintaining that human beings are as capable of responding to considerations of honor and pride as those of material benefit or historical inevitability. One of Bellamy's most successful modifications of what was popularly assumed to be Marxist doctrine was in a manner of uniformity. Satires on Marxism, and in fact on looking backward as well, make much of a dull sameness descending upon society as a consequence of a single non-competitive supp supplier filling the needs of a population lacking differentials in income, education, and basic outlook. Bellamy, however, neatly end runs this by allowing each person to apportion income as he or she chooses so that equal incomes need not mean uniform patterns of consumption. Furthermore, new product prod New products and activities can inter be introduced by means of clusters of individuals pooling their incomes for whatever joint purpose they please, even to the extent of starting a newspaper or a religious congregation of any persuasion. Looking backward makes much of the variety of fulfillments among its citizens as well as it might. This is one of Bellamy's most brilliant strokes in making Americans feel comfortable with goals passionately condemned when championed by Marxists. Even the regimentation inseparable from the industrial army is lightened by the delightful prospect of complete release at age 45 from the necessity of making a living. If Bellamy and Marx had run against each other for public office, Marx would have a lot of trouble topping that one. To each according to his needs is pretty dry compared to invent a Bellamyite slogan, something like, fully alive after 45. But of course, Marxism was disreputable less because of its visionary institutional features and social policies than because of its insistence upon materialism, determinism, and political revolution. Materialism gets its comeuppance in Mr. Barron's sermon, which ends in an evocation of something rather like the culminating star child in Arthur Clarke's 2001. For twofold is the return of man to God, who is our home, to return of the individual by way of death and the return of the race by fulfillment of evolution when the divine secret hidden in the germ shall be perfectly unfolded. The long and weary winter of the race has ended. Its summer has begun. Humanity has burst the chrysalis. The heavens are before it. When Frederick Engels wrote of the Marxist utopia, it is the ascent of man from the kingdom of necessity to the kingdom of freedom. He coined a neat secular slogan, but not one to soothe the fears of upright citizens who equate materialism with atheism. Determinism is undercut by Dr. Lee's pronouncement that the system under which the humanity lives in 2000 is entirely voluntarily the logical outcome of the operation of human nature under rational conditions. A logical outcome might be considered determinism of a sort, but the role of reason is more decisive than the case of historical inevitability. Bellamy presents the breakthrough into utopia as a result of intelligent human choice made under the guidance of a benevolent yet practical ethic, all more temperate and flattering than the rigid impersonality implied by historical determinism. These attributes of choice and reason also exercise in Dr. Lee's narration the most immediate bugbear of 19th century Americans in regard to Marxism, the necessary overthrow of the government. Bellamy dismisses the whole issue of revolutionary violence with breathtaking offhandedness. 
No sooner does Julian West conjure up the specter of the great bloodshed of terrible convulsions that it must have occurred during the massive transition to the world of 2000 than Dr. Leet, no doubt casually tapping the ash off his cigar, assures him that there was absolutely no violence. Everyone, masses and corporations alike, understood that the time had come for the great change. There was no more possibility of opposing it by force than by argument. The rest of his little speech, the only time the actual changeover to Utopia is referred to, is replete with phrases describing scales dropping from eyes. They came to realize, were now forced to recognize, had come to be recognized as an axiom. The new dispensation, one gathers, was not only not resisted, but was welcomed on all hands as if anything overdue. No threat to law and order in this revolution. Thus were put into acceptable American terms all the major aspects of Marxism, likely to arouse unreasoning hostility. Artfully put, one would say, except that the weight of evidence is that Bellamy was not even aware he was doing it. Then what accounts for the extraordinary aptness of his treatment of the radical themes he shared with Marx? The answer surely lies in the fact that these two men were working within profoundly different traditions. German philosophical systematizing, in the case of Marx, American pragmatism in that of Bellamy. Marx presented his utopian future as the capstone of an electable historical progression fueled by complex interactions between mind and matter. Bellamy's utopia is simply the outcome of a rational society's elimination of malfunctions through the logical application of existing organizational techniques, subject to an ethical code which already commanded a consensus. Marxism was, as far as its possibilities of acceptance in America went, mired by obtruse theory promising universal upheaval and practice. Looking backward, in contrast, is blissfully free of theoretical framing. Its communism could be assimilated to American ideals and traditions because it was presented as a platform of pragmatic reform to be acted upon by enlightened consensus. The crowning touch in its appeal, it may be speculated, lay in the fact that it sounded as if it would work, not had to or ought to, but would. With that, Bellamy's inadvertent Americanization of Marxism was complete. Bellamy likely did not read Marx until after the publication of Looking Backward. He may have read Lawrence Gronlund's The Cooperative Commonwealth, which was published in 1884. Gronlund was a Danish-American lawyer, writer, lecturer, political activist, and he was known for adapting Marx and Ferdinand LaSalle's communism to the American idiom. Gronlin said of the capitalist system, since labor under our wage system, our profit system, our fleecing system, only receives about one half of the value of its production as its share, it follows that the producers cannot buy back that which they create. For the more capital is being accumulated in private hands, the more impossible the wage system renders it for the producers to buy what they produce. The more necessary it becomes for capitalists to dispose of their ever-increasing fleecings, the less the ability of the people to purchase them will relatively become. The more capital, the more overproduction. Cronlin became a member of the Socialist Labor Party, the first Marxist Socialist Party in the United States. In 1887, he was called upon to differentiate the SLP's views from the single tax program of Henry George, um, who was at that time a candidate for mayor in New York City in 1886. Gronlin said that Henry George was a most noble man, the stating wedge for socialism in the United States, but his theory is insufficient and his remedies would not accomplish what he believes. When it comes down to the kernel of the matter, he's radically different from us and we must part company from him. Now, one of the most 
as I said, there were national nationalist clubs that that sprung up uh, throughout the United States, uh, inspired by Bellamy's looking backward. But one of one of the most remarkable utopian experiments um, in Bellamyism and Gronlandism was the Kawe colony. Colony, and I would like to read now uh, a short history of the Kawe colony by James O'Connell. Uh, author of Cooperative Dreams, A History of the Kauai Colony. From the very beginning, the story of Kauai was a human story of flesh and blood and passion and hope. Between 1886 and the spring of 1892, the area along the upper north fork of the Kauai River was the scene of an epic experiment in utopian socialism that, to this day, continues to be the subject of serious study by historians, writers, and students of economics, history, and political science. This was the Kauai Cooperative Commonwealth, generally referred to as the Kauai Colony. The colony was based upon the theories of Lawrence Grunlin, an American socialist originally from Denmark, whose book The Cooperative Commonwealth was the first adequate exposition of German socialism. Grunlin envisioned an ideal cooperative colony in which working members would own and control production and profit accordingly. Burnett G. Haskell, John Hooper Redstone, and James John Martin, all of whom had been active in labor organizations in San Francisco, were impressed with Grunlin's theories and decided to form a colony with timberlands as the source of income. After a search of the entire Pacific coast and parts of Mexico, the leaders of the proposed colony selected land between the Middle, Marble, and North Forks of of the Kauai River, which became the colony's namesake. Fifty-three timber claims totaling about 12,000 acres of adjoining land were filed in the General Land Office in Visalia. Because several of the applications gave the same San Francisco address and some were not U.S. citizens and due to the large number of claims, the Federal Land Commissioner in Visalia became suspicious of fraud. The colonists, however, were convinced their claims would eventually be validated by the courts and move forward with the venture. Membership in the colony cost $500, of which $100 was paid in cash, and the remainder in installments, good, or in labor. There were non-resident members from throughout the United States and Europe as well. Funds from these members were instrumental in keeping the colony solvent. Total membership was never more than 500. Actual residents, including the families of members, did not exceed 300. A medium of exchange based on units of time worked was set up for use in the colony. Under the system, a 200-minute paper time check was worth $1. There were 25-cent time checks good for one meal and others in either even smaller denominations. A medallion represented 24 hours of work. A colonist supposedly could cash in his time checks at the colony treasury so he could make outside purchases, but there was seldom enough in the treasury to support this practice. The first colony settlement, established in the spring of 1886, was called Arcady, later named Haskell's Bluff. It was a camp located three and a half miles up the North Fork from North Folk Fork from present-day Three Rivers on land owned by Sam Halstead. The first undertaking of the colony was to build a road to the timber claims so pine and fir lumber could be brought down from a sawmill in the forest. The colon colonists originally planned to build a railroad along the North Fork easterly along Yucca Creek, called East Branch by the colonists, and up to the sawmill in the vicinity of the future Colony Mill Ranger Station, which would become the entrance to Sequoia National Park created in 1890. The colonists soon realized their limited finances would not support a railroad project, and it was abandoned in favor of a wagon trail. Colony headquarters and the primary settlement during the road construction period were at Advance, a few miles up the North Fork of Arcady. The building of the road began October 8, 1886, and the work progressed. Various other road camps were established. After four years of backbreaking labor with a crew of 20 to 30 men and tools that consisted of little more than picks, shovels, and wheelbarrows, the road was completed. To this day, this handmade road is an engineering marvel, maintaining a gradual 8% grade for nearly 18 miles and 4,000 foot vertical elevation gain from start to finish. A sawmill was built and in operation by the summer of 1890, cutting lumber at the rate of 3,000 board feet per day. Concurrent with the completion of the road, Congress created Sequoia National Park. Any possibility of the colonists securing their timber claims was usurped with a stroke of the pen. They attempted to continue milling operations, but colony leaders were arrested for cutting timber inside the boundaries of the new park, California's first and the nation's second national park. 
The case was tried in Los Angeles federal court. The colonists were convicted of illegally cutting timber and were fined, but later acquitted on mail fraud charges. In the spring of 1891, the Secretary of the Interior argued that the timber claims were invalid and the colonists were ordered off the land. By 1892, the colony had disbanded and most of the colonists had moved away. James Martin attempted to obtain some compensation for damages he believes the colonists had sustained from the creation of Sequoia National Park and, as late as 1934, appealed to President Franklin D. Roosevelt for compensation in lieu of the timber claims. At that time, the General Land Office decreed the original opinion of the Federal Land Commissioner was to stand. Congressional committees investigated the case and their reports generally favored the colonists, but money was never apportioned for reimbursement. The road, with an eight-mile extension above its original terminus, built by the U.S. Cavalry in 1903 to allow tourists access to the Grant Sequoia Giant Se to the Giant Forest area, was the only vehicular access to Sequoia National Park until the completion of the present-day General's Highway in 1926. During the short existence of the Coway Colony, the colonists purchased the colonists published the first newspaper in the Three Rivers area, the weekly Coway Commonwealth, from which the current local newspaper and host of this website derived its name. Published from 1890 to 1892, the paper was mainly used as a propaganda tool for the Socialist Society, but each of the 96 issues also offered a first-hand glimpse of colony life, from business matters to recreational pursuits to, to births, marriages, and death. The weekly paper was printed on the first steam-operated press in Tulare County, given to the Callaway Colony by Dr. M. A. Hunter in exchange for membership. A lasting local vestige of the Callaway Colony is the Callaway Post Office that is now located three miles up North Fork Drive. On May 17, 1890, the Colony's Camp of Advance was granted a post office. From time to time, the building was moved to meet the needs of its patrons or to accommodate the postmaster. The present 10-foot by 12-foot structure was built in 1910. It is currently registered as a state historic landmark number 389. The Coway Post Office is still in operation today. Descendants from Coway Colony resident members still reside in the Three Rivers area. And there was a sequoia tree um, that they called in the uh, Tulare County there in the uh, Sierra Nevada mountains that they called the Karl Marx tree, uh, the Coway Colony called it, but then they, they decades later renamed it um, the General Sherman tree, but it's still there and it, it's still living. Um, by volume, the largest known living tree in the world, in fact. So uh, now known as the General Sherman tree, but, uh, but known uh, formerly as the Karl Marx tree. According to legend, when United States President Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, he said to her, so you're the lucky woman who wrote the book that started this great war. Whether in fact Lincoln really did say this is immaterial. Uncle, Co Un Uncle Tom's Cabin was a bestseller of the 1850s and 60s, and it brought realistic depictions of the horrors of slavery into the homes of millions of white Americans who might have otherwise never imagined the atrocities committed on southern plantations. Uncle Tom's Cabin inspired songs, plays, fashion, and even kitchenware. Many, including the Lincoln of legend, saw Stowe's writing as the catalyst for the American Civil War. Lincoln's purported comment illustrates the importance of stories. Stories are powerful, 
they can take the receiver of the story to a different place in time. They can resh reshape the receiver's vision of what is moral, just, and importantly, what is possible. What happens in reality can be guided by a committed group of individuals' affected articulation of a good story. Italian critical theorist Antonio Gramsci called an effective story a special relationship or bond between intellectuals and the people, the nation. Fiction has a powerful effect on the politics of postbellum America. Edward Bellamy's utopian socialist novel, Looking Backward, 2000 to 1887, published in 1888, was the third bestseller of its time after Uncle Tom's Cabin and Ben Hur. The novel articulated a vision of a future socialist America from the perspective of a Rip Van Winkle character who awoke in a much better world than the one that existed when he fell asleep. The story inspired its readers to take action to build the future Bellamy described. 165 nationalist clubs, so-called because they wanted to nationalize industries after Bellamy's description, sprung up throughout the United States by 1891. Others fused Karl Marx's scientific socialism with Bellamy's nationalism and the American utopian movements of the 1830s and 40s to form prefigurative socialist communities such as the Coway Colony and California's Sequoia region. The Bellamy movement led to the formation of the People's Party, also known as the Populist, in 1892. The Populist became a major electoral force that pushed both the major parties to the left. In 1935, Georgi Dimitrov at the Second Congress of the Comintern in Moscow expressed the importance of creating stories that connected contemporary struggles to the revolutionary history of the past. He was concerned that reactionary historical narratives were dominating the public imagination, remarking, the fascists are rummaging through the entire history of every nation so as to be able to pose as the heirs and continuers of all that was exalted and heroic in its past. While all that was degrading or offensive to the national sentiments of the people, they make use of as weapons against the enemy of, fascin of fascism. Hundreds of books are being published in Germany with only one aim, to falsify the history of the German people and give it a fascist complexion. The new baked National Socialist historians try to depict the history of Germany as if for the past 2,000 years, by virtue of some historical law, a certain line of development had run through it like a red thread leading to the appearance on the historical scene of a national savior, a messiah of the German people, a certain corporal of Austrian extraction. In these books, the greatest figures of the German people of the past are represented as having been fascist, while the great peasant movements are set down as the direct precursors of the fascist movement. Mussolini does his utmost to make capital for himself out of the heroic figure of Garibaldi. The French fascists bring to the fore as their heroine de Joan of Arc. The American fascists appeal to the traditions of the American War of Independence, the traditions of Washington and Lincoln. The Bulgarian fascists make use of the National Liberation Movement of the 70s and its heroes beloved by the people, Vasilevsky, Stepan Karaj, and others. Communists, who suppose that all this has nothing to do with the cause of the working class, who do nothing to enlighten the masses on the past of their people in a historically correct fashion, in a genuinely Marxist-Leninist spirit, who do nothing to link up the present struggle with the people's revolutionary traditions of the past, voluntarily hand over to the fascist falsifiers all that is valuable in the historical past of the nation, so that the fascists may fool the masses. Inspired by Dimitrov's sentiments, the Communist Party of the USA, under the leadership of Eric Browder, began to use the slogan, Communism is the 20th century Americanism, in order to link communist activities with the venerated revolutionary traditions of Thomas Paine and Abraham Lincoln. In their 1939 election platform, they wrote, Revolutionaries of all shades cry out against socialism. They say it is revolutionary. True, the change to socialism will be revolutionary. But since when is revolution un-American? On the contrary, revolution is one of the most powerful traditions of our people who are among the re most revolutionary in the world. Fiction is a tool that has historically been wielded to great effect by both the right and the left. Some have argued more recently that the strength of the pro-Trump QAnon movement, its symbols very visible in the Janu January 6, 2021 Capitol siege, is that it offers a narrative, albeit delusional, to explain inexplicable historical events. Hitler's Jewish conspiracy narrative served the same purpose after the failure of the Weimar Republic and the Spartacist Revolution to uplift the German economy. On the other hand, the popularity of 2020 presidential candidate Bernie Sanders was largely due to his compelling, compelling narrative that described an ultra-rich 1% of the population that has exploited and oppressed the rest of the 99% of the people. The story remains a compelling and persistent legacy of the Occupy Wall Street movement. 
Occupy and Sanders' narratives and the historical narratives of the broad left have the benefit of being based on economic and historical facts. Radically reactionary fascistic narratives like QAnon and the Jewish conspiracy are based almost entirely on fiction. Unfortunately, they proliferate because they are repeated so often. As Marx pointed out in his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, religion also serves this purpose. At times, it is the cry of the oppressed creature based on economic and historical realities. At other times, it is the opiate of the masses based on fictions repeated across centuries. Much of what Americans know about the Civil War has been invented by Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest and his pro-slavery secret society, the Ku Klux Klan, shortly after the end of the Civil War. The noble lost cause narrative portrayed in popular films like Birth of a Nation from 1915 and Gone with the Wind of 1940 has dominated entertainment and sadly even scholarship related to the American Civil War for over a century. To counter the Klan's reactionary narrative, it is important for the political left to articulate a narrative about the heroic actions of radicals during this revolutionary historical period. Thank you for listening to the first season of Pioneers of American Socialism.
start a new community. Communes and other kinds of experimental communities have been founded all across the country. Nearly everyone has thought about what an ideal world would be like, but few people have actually tried to put their thoughts to work, try to create a community according to their ideas. Experimental communities are not new. This village is called Arden. It was founded in 1900 for many of the same reasons that people are starting communes today. Take a look at Arden and you get an idea of what can happen when you plan and create a village. You can see the successes and failures, the problems, the problems that, are that are solved and the new tensions, and the new tensions that are born. That are born.